Hi. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this session where Julian, who is one of the apt maintainers, will tell us all about what he and his co-maintainers have been up to in the last year and maybe what he will do next year. Thanks. OK, um, in the past year, a lot of things happened in apt. And I want to start talking about fancy new security stuff. And first of all, file fetching. File fetching in app works using <coughs> methods that are processes which are run to fetch files using a single protocol. And usually a method runs for a single host. So if it fetches files from one host, and those files are downloaded to a partial subdirectory and then moved into the parent directory when they were successfully fetched. And what we did in one point, app 1.1 was we changed the user, the methods run as from root to the underscore app user and the nobody group. And we gave the, that user write access only to the partial files directory. So it couldn't write anywhere else on the system or read any home data or configuration data or stuff like that. That is not uh, permitted to read. And the files are then moved from partial to the main directory by the parent process. And you can see the permissions below. So the list directory has the normal permissions you would expect, which is 755. So, And the partial directory can only be modified and read and traversed by the apt user. And that has is quite nice, but it also has a few problems because currently the method verifies the file hashes, which is obviously a huge loophole because if we verify the file in the method we are running and the method is compromised, we could just say, hey, the file is correct and it would still, it would be used by the parent app process and then if it's a package, it would be installed and could have a backdoor or whatever. We can fix that. For example, we could pass the file, uh, we could check the file in the parent process, but then we would use the checksumming as root, which is also not so nice. So maybe we invoke a helper process, which we start as nobody, and that would be safe because it could read the file. We can pass it as a file descriptor, as an open file. And then it could just exit with zero if the file is verified correctly or with an error code if it's verified wrongly. What we are wondering about is if there's a performance regression because currently we're verifying the file while we are writing it. So we're taking a block of data, adding it to the checksum, and then we write it out. And if we do it in another process, we have to, sorry, <laughs> we have to read the file again, which is might be a bit slower, but it should be cached normally by the operating system, by the kernel. Another problem is methods can write to any file in the partial directory. They can also read any file in the partial directory or list all files in the partial directory, even the ones they are not responsible for, which means my method could now modify a different file from another method, and that would not be very nice. So one idea I had was to open the files in the parent process and send it, send it to the method using sockets. But that might take some time because it's a huge uh, change of the current protocol, which basically is text-based. We can also remove the read permission so we don't know which other files are in the directory. That might work. I'm not sure about the PDIF things, which require the multiple files. And because the files are merged, the patches for the packages files are merged, into one patch and then applied in one go by the method responsible for that. Another idea for further securing of the methods is seccomping, seccom sandboxing. So we can restrict the allowed size calls to uh, limit the attack surface. So if one size call has a problem, we can just, it, and it's blacklisted, we're not affected by it, which is quite nice. But we must maintain whitelists of the system calls that are needed by the method, which is a bit complicated. 
And it also has a problem because if you have a proxy script, you can have auto detection proxy scripts, you can specify them in a config file. They are run by the method and, well, they would inherit the restrictions of the, of the seccomp setboxing. I implemented this in a branch in my repository for the HTTP method, but I have not published it yet because, or I have not uh, released it in an app release because it's still a work in progress. Another topic was much more uh, publicized, I think. It was the SHA1 removal. So starting with 1.2.7, we are we considering SHA1 as an unsafe hash algorithm. And if you now miss an SHA2 field, that causes an error. And for the GBG signatures that are non-SHA2, they only cause warnings because there were just too many of them, and the whole thing would just break a lot of repositories more than it currently does. So we already broke some repositories. For example, all the Google repositories were broken, but they are fixed in now. It took some time, but it's, I'm glad they're working now. And warnings, as I said, there were lots of warnings. For example, uh, the Launchpad repo PPA repositories all produce warnings because they were all signed with an SHA1 hash sum. But they luckily had the right uh, type of uh, key. So they had uh, high bit RSA keys and not DSA keys because DSA keys would have been involved a migration uh, from, the DSA, from the DSA key to a new key, which is a bit more complicated than the changing the hash sum which could be done very easily in the Launchpad case. And one thing you know, a lot of users complained about, which I think is also a good thing that they complain about, but it's not that easy to fix, is uh, we can't disable the errors or warnings right now. So uh, it's not really possible to fetch, to fetch repositories that miss uh, SHA2 fields because app will just error out and you can't do anything about it. But that might be fixed in 1.3. Not entirely sure yet, but that's the plan. So you can say, okay, I want to allow this repository to have an SHA1 key. So for example, if you go to art to a snapshot from Debian, an old snapshot from Edge or something like that, and that is weakly signed, then you can just say, hey, I want to trust this because I need to do stuff with it for historical reasons. And in January 2017, so next year, we will start to treat the weak signatures of the release files as errors as well, because that's a good point, I think. The browsers are doing it as well, so that's the common SHA1 deprecation point. And so I thought, let's do this too. Probably also for the Ubuntu LTS release, which already has this whole thing enabled. But we can think about that later. That was it for security. Another very interesting topic was performance. And you might have noticed that app got a lot faster between 1.1 and 1.2. And the obvious reasons were we forgot buffering in the uh, PDF applying and introduced read buffering in 1.16 and 1.17, which made the update take four seconds instead of 41 seconds. So it actually becomes useful now. In 1.1.9, we introduced white buffering, which further improved the runtime. So applying a patch now takes half of the time in my test scenario, which involved a huge contents file and a huge patch. And in 1.2, we are starting the processes in parallel, so you can patch multiple packages files in parallel, which vastly improves performance again because it now scales up to the repositories, up to the size of your CPU core count. Now comes another trick, especially for app file. We introduced LC4 support in 
which means we can dynamically recompress files we fetch using the LC4 compression algorithm. And we're doing this for contents files especially because content files are really huge and they take a lot of time to compress with gzip and you don't want to store them uncompressed so whenever we have to update them we have to decompress them, apply the PDFs to the contents file and then recompress the contents file which is insanely slow, it takes multiple seconds for one file and with the LC4 support we can do this in a far shorter time, I have not measured it or at least I don't remember how far how, uh, how much it was but I think it's less than a second now, which is quite nice. There's also the uh, gzip indexes option, which exists for far longer time already. As the name implies, it was originally used for gzip indexes, so all files were stored as gzip indexes in the list directory. But now we use uh, LC4 support for that as well, but that's configurable with a config option somewhere, but I don't currently know where that is. So uh, it's probably somewhere documented, but I don't have it in my mind right now. So what the effect of the whole thing was that, apart from updating much faster, app file improved performance as well. So if you search something in, with app file, you search for a file, or you search which package contains which files, it should now be six to seven times faster than it was before app 1.2 which I think is really, really nice. And the GZIP index is now only 20% slower than uncompressed files, about 20% slower, which is good because you can just compress, keep the files compressed and you don't really notice the difference in performance. So now we come to a bit more complicated things, or more internal things that do performance. The first was string views. So when we're reading a file, a packages file for example, we want to get the data from the packages file into our cache file. And what we did previously was we read it into a buffer, then we created the string out of the buffer, and then maybe we trimmed the string or did some other modifications on the string. And that copied a lot of data. So in uh, 1.2 we introduced uh, string views which are class similar to strings but instead of strings, they don't hold the data themselves, but they only reference a block of memory and have a length. They are originally uh, introduced in the C++17 standard, and we have our own limited implementation thereof. So we can do that without depending on C++17, which would be not a good idea. And the original idea for the string use thing was the port uh, to the iPhone that was done by the Citium maintainer because on the iPhone the things were really slow and the memory was really slow and that took a lot of time apparently so he replaced uh, the strings with his own kind of string view he named it differently but it's not really relevant it is very similar to a string view and this reduced data copying a lot because now we can basically read it into a buffer of the packages file and then we write the buffer direct from the buffer directly into our cache file without doing any copy in between. And that is probably a huge benefit for devices that have a low memory bandwidth, such as embedded devices like the iPhone, was, and other devices, I mean, uh, the Raspberry Pi or something like that. <coughs> and another thing that was really annoying because it was very slow was syncing of the head of the cache file when we wrote it also after we wrote it we the cache file had a dirty bit set so then we synchronized the file with the storage device then we unset the dirty bit and synchronized again which meant the entire updating was blocked at the end on a huge f-sync call which really uh, bound the performance of the update call to the performance of the storage device. And what can we do to improve this? We introduced a checksum and we're writing an Adler checksum into this checksum field in the cache. We use Adler checksums because they are in the GZIP library available and we depend on the GZIP library so 
That was easy and they're faster than the CIC checksum. And the idea is now obviously, if we wrote the cache, we verified the checksum, and if the checksum matches, the, check, the cache is okay. And if not, um, the cache is maybe too short, or some bits flipped, or something like that. So that's better, even better than a dirty bit. But it means that uh, read performance is now slower. So if you say app cache show, it now takes a bit longer. I think 80 milliseconds instead of 8 milliseconds on my system, for example. That's not really noticeable in most systems. But the performance in the update case is much better now because it now does not need to sync data anymore, which was really stupid because it's a cache file. We don't really need this file on the device. If it's broken, we can just generate a new one. And the data integrity is also nice to have. I wanted that for quite a long time because we always have segmentation faults in app that nobody knows why they're happening. And mostly it's just because the cache is in some way borked. So it's good to have this. And before I forget it, I also increased the hash table size. We have a fixed hash table size. So every package name is introduced in the hash table size and it has fixed size. And it was 16,000 uh, slots in the table, which was obviously not a good idea anymore because we have a lot more than 16,000 package names. So I chose to increase it to 50,000 and also switch to a different hash algorithm, but that's the DJB algorithm. You probably know that algorithm. It's quite popular. But one thing I really like in apt 1.1 was Pinning. Pinning did not really work that well in the past. In the old pinning algorithm, each package has one pin. And these pins, call, we call them specific form pins. And sources also have pins, and we call them general form pins. So they, those are the package uh, colon uh, star pins. And the first specific pin matching a package is a specific pin that applies to it. And that worked. A bit, you see, this case works. It has two general pins. Experimental is pinned to 100, and unstable is pinned to 900. And it now picks correctly the unstable version of Firefox. But, well, let's say we don't want to install Firefox from experimental, so we pin it to minus 1, which means do not install this. Because it's packed specific pin, this did not really work. App tells you oh no, I don't want to install any of these versions. And that's obviously not what we want, right? We want to install the unstable version still. Just ignore the experimental version. And in apt 1.1, that's exactly what we do. We now pick the unstable Firefox again. If you now pin the experimental version, uh, the unstable version to minus one, it would automatically pick the experimental version. That's really, might not be a good idea to automatically install experimental packages, but you also have the same issue if you have backports of a new package and it doesn't exist in your stable distribution. And Kao says that looks much better. Right, Kao? Okay. So what's the difference? We assign the pins not to packages anymore, but to versions. And the version, now the first specific pin matching a version applies to the version. And if there is no specific pin for the version, the priority is the maximum priority of all sources. This also means that choosing a candidate version is now much easier. So we reduce the code by two thirds of the size. And it just now finds the version with the highest pin. And that is not a downgrade unless the pin is above 1,000, which is the magic allow downgrade pin value. Now, a bit of other stuff. You probably don't know about that yet, but in 1.3, app will auto-remove, will only keep the latest provider of a virtual package. So if you have multiple Linux images installed, and those all provide some kind of virtual, the same virtual package, let's say it pro they provide Linux modules, and you have a package depending on Linux modules, apt 1.2 or older would not 
remove any of the Linux images you installed because it thinks that your packages, depending on the modules package, depend on all of the kernels because it just transitively goes through the tree and sees, oh, they reference the kernel somehow and then says, oh no, the kernel is used. We don't want to remove that. And in 1.3, we look at the source package and only keep the latest provider of the source package, which means that the kernel example now works. This is very important for some Ubuntu people because they have ZFS modules in their kernel and packages depending on the ZFS modules virtual package, and that means they don't get any kernels auto-removed anymore. Now it works again. <laughs> yes. Cache some, you might have noticed after the FTP archive was really slow. I think I've read a lot of bugs reports about that. That was because the hash sum caching was broken in 1.1, but in 1.3 it's fixed again thanks to a pull request on our GitHub instance, on our GitHub mirror. And that's cool because it now actually is usable for larger things again. Another interesting fact is that I merged a patch for the FTP method that was lying around in the BTS since uh, 2007. <laughs> and it applied cleanly because nobody takes care of the FTP method anymore. <coughs> and the patch was about passive methods of FTP servers returning responses we did not expect. But you can look at the back report or the comment message if you want to know more about that. Also, we have a systemd service and a systemd timer. And previously, that was a grunt job. And it had a check if it's running on battery or not. So the grunt job automatically updates your indices on your device. So it runs automatically upgate update. And previously, we checked if we're running on battery. And then we basically exit with zero. That was not. A good idea for, because it's not really overridable anymore. Uh, because it's not overridable, so you can't say, I want to always run this uh, updating even if I'm on a battery. In 1.3, you can do this because you can now use, set that in the systemd unit by setting condition AC power to false in your override unit thingy. I don't know what they're calling that. So a bit of a recap, stuff from 1.1. We introduced the ability to install local Debian packages. So you can just say app install dot slash file dot app. I can specify any absolute path or relative path, but you have to start relative path with a dot and a slash because otherwise app will not recognize them for safety reasons. So we don't just specify a package by uh, a file name by accident and actually mean a package or something like that. You can do the same thing with build dependencies. So you can say apt build app directory, or you can say apt build app bsc file, and it will do that. I have that here. So I can say. Right, and it installs all the build up, build dependencies for the package rep repro. That's quite cool. And also, okay. We could. I also had another example with a DSC file, but that's not really important. Um, there's also this by hash thing. You might have noticed it. The archive now used that uh, was an announcement about that. And this works basically by uh, uh, storing the files using the hash value. So you create the hex di digest, digest, and then you store them in the by hash subdirectory. And there is the subdirectory with the hash algorithm name. And there are files named by the hex digest. And the main packages files just link to them, or the other way around. But this way, it makes most sense. And this is really useful because it prevents hash sum mismatches, which were quite common previously. Because now you can update a mirror basically transactionally. 
So you can update everything except the release file first, and then update the release file, and it just works as you would expect it to. Future stuff. Actually, I wanted to work on that before, but I didn't really make it. Patterns, for example, I wanted to work on patterns during dev camp, but I did not really manage to write anything useful yet. You know patterns from aptitude. We're trying to bring the same patterns to apt. So you can then use patterns on all apt comment lines and in preferences files, which I think will be quite useful. Also, David is working on improving the communication between apt and dpackage. You might have heard about the installation ordering, the problems of uh, specifying the order in which packages are passed to dpackage and grouped into dpackage calls. And David is implementing uh, an external uh, protocol, a protocol for external uh, installation planners that where you have external programs that can then return an order in which packages should be installed. This is his Summer of Code project. And there's also already a 0.1 version in the Git repository that's about to be uploaded. I don't know if it actually works. I haven't really tried it out yet. But you can ask David in the IRC channel if you want to know more about that. And finally, depth delta support. I think it might make sense to introduce depth delta support natively or another thing that is similar to depth delta for users in areas that don't have good internet connectivity. I think a lot of Indian users have that problem and in Africa probably as well. So that would be a good idea to have. If you want to help us, we're especially looking for people maintaining uh, apt FTP archive and our deselect integration because we don't really use the deselect integration or really know what it's doing. It's a shell script, so it should be accessible to maintain. And apt FTP archive is also not really used anymore by us, so we don't do much work on it, just fix bugs if we can, or we don't spend too much time on it. And if you want to help, you can submit patches or pull requests at the bug tracker on our mailing list or on our GitHub mirror. GitHub mirror is a bit manually maintained, so I have to manually push uh, new comments there currently. It was working automatically, but currently it's not. But well, you can submit pull requests there and issues if you want to. And we'll take care of them. You can also contact us on the mailing list and the IRC channel. If you have other questions, if you want to discuss bugs, if you want to discuss patches or whatever, you just contact us and we'll find out what we can do. That's it already. So questions? Uh, first of all, thanks to all the app maintainers for making our lives easier. Uh, I have quite a few questions uh, and simple ones. So the first is uh, when I'm installing, let's say, any DAP package, is there a checksum? Uh, like, for example, uh, maybe I take it from the Debian mirror or I took it from somewhere, and I'm not really sure about the authenticity of that package. Is there a way to uh, know is, is the signature there or something so we know that it's all well and good or there's nothing happening there? Well, if you manually download the file and then pass it to install, yes, um, then you can't very then app can't verify it, but it might in, in some ways in some circumstances it uses the version in the mirror instead. So I'm not sure if that's still happening, but it did use to do that. Okay, but that's probably not what you want. So um, currently yeah, there's no, no way to verify if, it. If there was some sort of a checksum or something, because once you update the index. There are times where you're not able to, you, you go to a place or somewhere where you're not able to get the whole mirror happening. Yep. But you're able to get the one package or group of packages that you can install from the web. You can just take them from the web and just install it in your this. 
but I do not know whether there is some way in figuring out or knowing that this is the right thing. Of course, the, the idea is that because you're taking from a mirror or you're taking from Debian somewhere, it will be all good. But internally, is there a way to check that? Theoretically, if you had the indexes updated, you could verify it with the code, but we don't have any command for that yet. Okay. Okay, the second thing which, uh, because I saw it very, okay. The, the second question which I had uh, was uh, basically uh, at some points what happens is, uh, which has happened with me quite sometimes, is that sometimes the uh, index get corrupted. So like var lib apt, I need to uh, remove all the stuff and then try and update again. Yeah. <laughs> anything, uh, anything coming in near future will, which will maybe even if, if it's not Let's say this days, maybe two days back index, so I can build and have a smaller PDF, something like that. So you want to basically back up the local files and then restore yeah. from Yeah, one way is, of course, that I can just take in this, but that becomes kind of a headache doing that all the time because you never know. For instance, where I come from, sometimes electricity goes when I'm updating the index or something like that. And it becomes a pain to actually do that again and again. And if you're doing it from the ground up, it takes quite a while to get the whole index updated. Yep. We don't have anything planned for that yet. So maybe we can think about it, but it's about probably a bit difficult to do. OK. Yeah, yeah. But there are also more issues with the whole index corruption thing, because app doesn't automatically detect that and remove the files, which would be nicer. So maybe we can have some kind of fsck command, which verifies that the files we downloaded are still correct and then automatically ask you to remove them or something like that. And lastly, I think this feature has been there for quite some time, or at least I think I saw it on the BTS, that let's say when, you, when I'm uh, upgrading uh, a package or upgrading a bunch of packages, updates have come in. And uh, sometimes some bugs have a severe or a uh, RC bug or some bug which is there. Uh, before installing or before downloading the packages, if a way could be done so that the RC bugs come first so we know, okay, these are the packages which I do not need to download. Well, um, that's app list bugs, which is showing the bugs, and that's a hook that runs after the download, I think. Yeah. And maybe that we can do some pre-download hook, but I'm not quite sure if that exists yet or if it's Somebody's working on it. OK, thank you. Hi. Oh. So are you around with some time over the next couple of days to discuss um, a new feature request? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Um, Ish. I'll, I'll fill in a little bit more. I've floated the idea with some other guys, and I've been totally slow and rubbish at getting through to the app team about it yet. Um, the existing app CD ROM support is very brittle and rotten and old, yep. and I know you guys hate it and are not really interested. Yeah, we don't use CD ROM at all. Well, exactly. You guys don't, but unfortunately, a lot of other people do. Um, what I'd like to propose is throwing it away and replacing it with something apt called apt removable instead. Um, say, for example, at the moment, if people install off a USB stick, uh, which is much, much more common, um, but they don't have a good net connection, um, if later on they want to install more packages, apt will happily tell them, please insert the CD1, um, which matches the information that was on the USB stick. Um, but will never actually pick up on the USB stick if it's, in, if it's inserted manually. Um, yep. You know, this is a bit rubbish for people um, who don't know any better, and, and we've had a whole slew of, of complaints about it over the last few years. It would be really, really awesome if we could plug in to, say, UDEV or similar to recognize a piece of, of generic removable media rather than CD1 has been, in, has been plugged in, pick up on the metadata, and do the right thing. But I'll get, I don't want to take up all the time here. I'd like to talk to you about it and go we through what I've thought time, about it. <laughs> um, I'll sit down with you at some point in the next couple of days if I can, if, you, if you're around. Yes. 
But that's good. Okay. I think the idea is a good idea. Sure. I then it then expands into crazy ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would be what might be useful for would be say automatic discovery of mirrors. Um, a of mirror, what? just uh, say oh, yeah. in a local um, archive mirror on your network could potentially be advertised using um, multicast DNS and so on, Avahi, and then just looks like a removable thing. Yeah, you can currently do that with a mirror detection, with a proxy detection strip for proxies. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking there's probably a good way that, you know, a, a lot of this code could even be common. But let's talk in the next couple of days. Yeah. Other questions? So I arrived late and missed most of your talk, so maybe you addressed this already. But uh, I see you worked. On, I saw you worked on pinning. Um, do you plan to support pinning per source package? For example, it would be really useful to pin uh, all binary packages from the GCC default slash experimental source package. Yes, I think uh, not maybe direct support for source package pinning, but. If we have patterns, then we automatically will have source package so pinning support because you can specify a, pack, a pattern that says source and the name of the source package. Anyone else? Okay. Let's thanks Julian again.